Hello and welcome to the Brett Norman YouTube channel. Today we have an upload from Jörg Glissman of Belgium, Behind the Dictators. This is the chapter entitled Nazi Socialism and Catholic Restoration. This is the whole point. Um, most people of the world or friends, family, whatever, that listen to this video uh, will probably not benefit if they are attached to the narrative that the media at this present day and age is giving us. You know, um, a lot of the politics are, are very big diversion from the truth of what this history and this religious and political history is telling us. So this is one of the most important things in doing your own research, in studying on your own, is to come to the knowledge of some kind of... of uh, what can we say, biblical truth, because uh, this world will want to make uh, political truth out of it. And uh, the political truth only serves to undermine the biblical truth. So you have this concept of uh, learning against learning, that is what Rome has used from the beginning of the Counter-Reformation, is to place Bible learning in one camp and to pit the worldly learning against it and to secularize all these things. Uh, a lot of really good points Yerk makes in this video. And uh, it is very, very much in uh, contrast to what we see in our present day and age. And we have a lot of people that uh, don't want to hear it. But those are the people that really need to reconsider, if you ask me. But it's not about me. It's about the truth. And as we know, the truth is singular. It is not plural. There is only one truth that will set you free. And there is only one sacrifice through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that will save us from our own sin that we have committed unjustly. And that's all of us. Now, brace yourself this is a big study. Uh, it is, um, well, you know, it's nothing new if you've studied history before, especially history that has been, uh, shall we say, uh, obfuscated. I don't know if you've ever heard of the word obfuscate, but it is to hide or to conceal uh, something by uh, putting things in front of it and uh, making it uh, harder for the average person to recognize or to perceive. So this is typically what happens in life is, um, you know, there are things that we learn through our experiences that no one had ever told us about and uh, reveal a uh, part of truth that uh, has not really been recognized before. And I believe this is basically how myself and perhaps others have come to the knowledge of the Bible and the value of becoming a born-again Bible-believing Christian. And how much differently that position is from every other position in this world. Now, this reading and discussion that Yerk has done 
Nazi socialism and Catholic restoration from the book Behind the Dictators has a lot to do with what is going on today in America, in the United States, with our um, corporate government that was conceived by this wilderness beast that we live in. And this happened after the Civil War. Basically, they pitted the North against the South. And from that horrible, horrible war, uh, the whole nation lost all of its uh, wealth. Let's just put it that way. And it had to be rebuilt, and it was rebuilt by the uh, European central bankers. And they had planted their influence into the United States at that point. But I'm getting into some of my own research that I've done on my own. And I think it's really important for people to research things on their own and come to their own conclusions in due time and it takes a long time it's not something that comes easily it takes a lot of effort and if you have no motivation then you're probably not going to study so this reading and discussion is for those of you out there that are willing to take the time to really listen and think about the principles being talked about here and do your own research on them in your spare time and learn them on your own because really that's the best way to learn something is to do your own hands-on approach and approach it from your own perspective and don't let anyone tell you what to think of it. Uh, Just do it yourself. And that's what this is all about. That's what this channel is all about. It's enabling you to come to this knowledge of... uh, Jesus' sacrifice for our transgressions, our sins, and and the new life that we can live through the Bible, through the words Jesus gave us, his testimony, through the, uh, the writers of the Bible. And this is where faith should be uh, resting upon, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, the, our faith really needs to be resting upon the Scriptures and the Scriptures alone. Because if we don't have that, then men can come along and change the words into anything they wish. And this is what's happened, and this is what's going on. And again, don't let me tell you what to think. Research it for yourself, find out for yourself, and believe it for yourself. Don't believe it for my sake. You know, that means nothing. So, all right. So, Yerk Glissman made some very important comments in this video, and I urge you to listen, pay attention, and try to recognize that Yerk is not alone in his belief that the Nazi socialist and Catholic restoration had occurred in the first beast that rose out of the sea. It is now occurring in the second beast that rose out of the wilderness in the United States. And to understand Uh, You must read the book of Revelation, understand uh, that chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I mean, you you really should read the whole Bible because uh, the gospel message really is the entire Bible as far as I'm concerned. All of it applies. It all applies. It's all important because it all teaches different aspects of life and how to deal with situations and problems and with uh, families and with uh, 
different parts of the world. All of this relates to, really, I mean, the Bible is the owner's manual for the human soul. And if you wish to retain your soul, you better get cracking in the Bible. And that's the main impetus of this study. But we also need history that is very, very foundational to our understanding about these prophecies being fulfilled in the Bible. So with that, I'm going to let you listen to Yerk Lisman's reading and discussion, and I urge you to stay focused on the study as we lead up to our releasing of his reading of the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And this is a very, very important book. And the reason I am re-uploading it basically is just to provide more support and learning in the process of coming to this knowledge of the Jesuit order and how we can deal with that in this present present day and situation that we might be living in in any area of the world. So again, I thank you for listening and joining me in our little journey here into the reading and discussion of this book. Let's get right into it. Hello everyone and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one is called Nazi Socialism and Catholic Restoration. The continuance after the last video, the greatest Trojan horse of them all, which was chapter 7. We are now already in chapter 8 of the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehman from 1942, remind you. I remind you because 1942 is quite some time ago, but when I read through this book, I see so much resemblance with the days of today, 2016. It's just incredible when you have eyes to see and ears to hear. So this one's called Nazi Socialism and Catholic Restoration. So let's get the job done and read a little bit in this wonderful book from Herbert Leo <laughs> Lehman. I always forget his last name. Catholic action instituted by Antichrist Pope Pius XI is a generic term for Catholic reform and reconstruction. The restoration of Catholicism to the position of authority which it held over the nations before the Reformation. And I already have to go into a little comment after the first sentence. This is, in other words, the time before the Reformation, as it's called, <clears throat> this is, in other words, the New World Order, explained as the restoration of the Old World Order, as I have been telling people since long already. There is no New World Order, there is only the restoration of the Old World Order, when the Pope reigned sovereign over the kings of the earth. And this is exactly what we see today. The Antichrist, using the apostate Protestant countries, United States of America at the top, to restore his quote-unquote glory from before the Protestant Reformation. It has a twofold object. The purge of, a liber of liberal elements within the Church itself and the complete destruction of Protestantism and its liberalizing effects in those countries which threw off the yoke of the papacy in the past. Catholic action was brought into being co coincidentally with the rise of Nazi fascism and was later consolidated by the Lateran Pact with Mussolini in 1929 and by the Concordat with Nazi Socialism in 1933. It gained its objectives to a larger extent in Europe through the military might and fifth column methods of its Nazi fascist partner. It can be safely said continues the author, that Nazi fascism and Jesuitism, the two greatest reactionary forces in the world today, 1942 remind you, are but two facets of the same unity, one civil and the other 
ecclesiastical. Now, you remember the quote that I read earlier to you from the Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini, from among others in the chapter 6 it was quoted in this book? Quote, Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism, because it is the merger of corporate and state power, and not to forget the state and the church work together as one power. So you have actually three things under one roof. Corporatism, the church and the state. For an authoritarian civil state cannot function properly without the help of an author author authoritarian ecclesiastical system. It is nonetheless true, uh, though not sufficiently recognized, that a free electoral state is impossible without the spiritual support and nourishment of a free church. Free of what? Free of the laws of God. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is always aiming to. Nazi fascism's anti-Semitic ideology, its anti-Masonic and anti-democratic activities, its propaganda methods, the hierarchical structure of its organization and even its war program were copied from the Jesuit order. Remember the quote from Civilta Catholica that fascism is the political direction comes closest to the Roman Catholic Church's idea. The Crusades of the Middle Ages also began with persecution of the Jews and were preceded by a purging within the Church itself. Likewise, a brutal cleansing within Catholicism preceded the wars of religion instigated by the Jesuits in the 16th and 17th centuries. Its object was to rid Catholicism of the heretical Protestant influences which had arisen within the Church's organization before and after Martin Luther's time. It is in the light... <coughs> It is in the light of these events that Nazi socialism's fight with all the churches in Germany must be regarded. On the one hand, it was an attempted purge of recalcitrant elements within the Roman Catholic Church, which had been infected with liberal and protestant ideas during the post-war years in Germany under the Weimar Republic. On the other hand, it was a fight against protestantism and its liberal institutions, which had been afforded still greater scope for development after the fall of the monarchy in 1918. The fight was carried out in both instances according to the traditional methods of the Jesuit strategy. Now, what is this Jesuit strategy that the author uh, is mentioning here? I'm going to explain that to you direct now. As we know from the Jesuit oath of induction, where it states, quote, to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means, unquote. That is traditional methods of Jesuit strategy. Always controlling both sides. Many Americans, however, do not see it in this light. They think only of the fact that the Hitler regime in the beginning interned Catholic priests in concentration camps because they refused to obey his dictates that heads of religious orders were brought to trial for smuggling money out of the country, that some of the members of religious orders were arrested and found guilty of crimes against morals, that some priests were imprisoned for allegedly harboring communists, that, Hitlerites, that the Hitlerites turned against Cardinal Fallhaber, Cardinal Initzer and the Bishop of Salzburg, that public school education was taken out of the hands of the priests of Austria, that the Catholic Center Party was annihilated and its members persecuted, 
that its leader, Dr. Klausner, was assassinated on June 30th, 1934, in Hitler's so-called blood purge. Now, I just mentioned here Cardinal Faulhaber. And who was he? A very important person that you have to look up. And I looked it up on Wikipedia and will provide the link uh, to that in the description box of the video. He was the editor of the papal encyclical Mit brennender Sorge, which means in English, with burning concern, in 1937, under Pope Pius Antichrist, by the personal request even of Antichrist Pope Pius XI. He was the editor of that paper. A very important person, and as I told you, I will provide the link in the description box of the video for your own research, so that you can go even deeper into that what I'm just reading here to you. Because just reading this book and just listening to the book will not give you the full understanding. You have to do your own research along with it. These and other facts are at times cited to show that Nazi socialism seems to be actively opposed to the Catholic Church. You see? Again, the Jesuitical strategy. They are, however, merely facts whose real significance is hidden beneath the surface. In reality, they are not indications of a war against the Roman Catholic Church as a whole, but only against certain groups opposed to a corresponding plan of reconstruction and fascist regimentation instituted at the same time by Antichrist Pope Pius XI within the Church itself. Hitler, Goebbels, a Knight of Malta von Papen, and the greatest part of the highest officials in the Third Reich are Catholics by birth and education. <laughs> and by education, we are all made Catholics today, if you do not pay attention and do not have the Word of God right next to you and with you always and have Jesus with you who tells you the truth and shows you the truth whenever you compare anything in this world to the written word that he wrote in the Bible and gave to us. To us. Hitler, Goebbels and von Papen were by birth and education Catholics and we are all made Catholics through Jesuitical education, learning by learning, ratio studiorum. And we have to be aware of that, because everywhere in this world out there, this is to be found. So every time we go out in the world, we are confronted with Catholic teaching, whether we understand it, or we don't, but that's the way it is. And only when you stand firm on the rock, Jesus Christ, you can stand firm and see this betrayal and see through this so-called education or indoctrination, brainwashing the Catholics give us. But okay, the author continues, the popular confusion about the relations between the Roman Catholic Church and Nazi Socialism is due to the fact that few people have any precise knowledge of the inner workings of the Roman Catholic Church. First of all, they have been made to believe that Roman Catholicism is Christianity, which it is not the Roman Catholic Church does not represent Christianity. So that is a very popular confusion about the relations between the Roman Catholic Church and Nazi Socialism. That's also a very popular confusion that the Roman Catholic Church puts out there today. They pose themselves as Christians, which they are not. It's the Church of Babylon. It's the Whore of Babylon. It's the Synagogue of Satan. It's the whore of Babylon spoken about in Revelation 17. They have been led to believe that Catholicism is a rigidly uniform system. The truth of the matter is that it is not the wonderful unity that it is generally supposed to be. 
Like all natural and historical phenomena, the Roman Catholic Church is also subject to the law of polarity and philosophical contradictions. It has always had its conservative, reactionary element pitted against opposing liberal groups. In order, therefore, to understand fully the status of the Roman Catholic Church in relation to Nazi socialism, it is absolutely necessary to know the details of these opposing tendencies and forces within the Church's organization. History alone can furnish the key to the mystery. History alone can furnish the key to the mystery. And that's why it is so important to do your own studies on the real history, on the hidden history, and you can only discover that when you have the Bible to stand on. History is being taught all over the world as that what they want us to know, what they want to teach us, and that is not the truth. Reading through the book Rulers of Evil is an absolute experience I advise everyone to have, because then you see the big difference between the real finding elements of the founding elements of the founding of the United States of America in 1776 and that what is taught in school and in universities and in history books all over the world. And then you see how different it actually was. And even if you dismiss what Tapa Saucy wrote in his book, Rulers of Evil, when you, th when you say, oh, that can't be true, and he's making this up, and he's making that up, I don't agree that he made it up, but if you think so, just take a look around in the world today, in 2016, and see where America has so called, when you can say that that way, where it has, where it has gone from 1776, when it was so called a Protestant nation to be founded, where has it developed to up to today in 2016? And if you cannot see that, and when you cannot see there the hidden hand of the Vatican and the Jesuits in there, I cannot help you. I think nobody can help you if you are not willing to see what happened there. An outstanding Catholic historian, Joseph Schmidlin, and um, I will provide also a link uh, in the description box of the video where you can find a PDF of his book, The History of the Popes in Modern Times, or at least a part of that, because I couldn't find it in whole, but this is just, I think, chapter 25 and 26 or something that I found there. An outstanding Catholic historian, Joseph Schmidlin, draws a clear picture of the different fractions which existed within the Catholic Church towards the end of the 19th century, and how victory for the intransigent Jesuit party led to the rise of fascism. The following, from his History of the Popes of Modern Times, is to the point. Quote, the history of the popes during the 19th century presents a succession of divergent systems following each other like a game of opposites and of warring forces striving for the mastery, with first one side winning and then another. On one side are the zealots striving in an intransigent and intolerant manner to preserve fixed traditions and orthodoxy and to take a hostile attitude towards the progress of modern civilization and the liberal victories that followed on the great revolutions which are the unremitting enemies of the Roman Catholic Church, the state and the principle of authority. On the other side are the liberals who, actuated by a more equitable political sense, endeavoured to break free from the traditional restraints bound up with the ideas of old, and who try to reconcile themselves with modern progress in order to live in peace with liberal states and governments, and to integrate the, integrate the Church as a spiritual force in contemporary civilization. From the beginning, this warlike game of of opposites, has been going on within the Roman Curia, 
and especially within the College of Cardinals. It is most evident in the papal conclaves which become the stage for this play of divergent tendencies which are afterwards openly expressed in the attitudes of successive pontiffs. For the popes support one or the other of these tendencies and personify them by the conduct of their internal and foreign policies after mounting the papal throne. Unquote. Thus, it can be seen that the Roman Catholic Church has been torn between two main irrecon irreconcilable factions, corresponding to the two opposing ideologies of fascism and democracy, which are warring to the death at present all over the world. They are two distinct parties, those uh, they are two distinct parties whose effects are felt in all ecclesiastical groups in the Church. They are particularly active during times of papal elections, and at all times go beyond the field of religion and profoundly affect political and social affairs. Their effect can easily be seen in every phase of social and political life in the United States of America. The fighting between these two opposing factions has been increasingly evident since the time of the encyclopedists. The spirit of progress has developed so strongly in the 18th century, even within the Catholic Church, that Antichrist Pope Clement XIV was able to succeed where other popes had failed, in completely suppressing the society of Jesuits, which represented, then as now, the intolerant and intransigent element of Roman Catholicism. In spite of Pope Clement's irrevocable decree, however, the Jesuits were again restored to power by Pope Antichrist Pope Pius VII after the fall of Napoleon in 1814. Now I have to make two little comments here. The first one is, of course, well, I, I don't have to go into commenting on this part, actually, of Lehman's assumption here, because as a loyal listener to my videos, you know that the banishment of the Jesuit order was just a blown cover as cover to secularize the order, which they successfully did. Whoever believes the order lost power during or after the banishment has not understood even a fraction of the tactics of the order, and it would be a waste of time to go into that here and now. So just understand then, please, banishment or not, the Jesuits are in total control of all media, education, science, economics, politics, etc., and have been at all times since their foundation, whether directly or through organizations, societies, secretly or openly. You just have to understand the Sun Tzu techniques of the art of war which the Jesuits invented and play out to the fullest of their advantages. You know, Pope Clement XIV, he could have never done the banishment of the Jesuit order in 1773 if it was not the wish and the plan of the at that time ruling general of the society, Lorenzo Ricci. You learn by getting through my reading of Rulers of Evil that Clement XIV was a pupil of Ricci all the time of his pontificate. All the time he was a pupil of the general, the black pope the general of the Society of Jesus. He just followed orders. And of course he knew he would die afterwards. He couldn't survive. But the end justifies the means. The church has to be the gainer in the end, not the pope that is at that moment sitting on the throne or anybody else. The church, the synagogue of Satan. But continuing in the book. But the liberal Catholic groups which recognized to a certain extent the victories won by the French Revolution managed to exist 
<coughs> to exist side by side with the Jesuit reactionary group, which has always regarded the liberal progress of civilization as something pernicious and diabolic. The progressive groups did all they could bring. The, uh, the progressive groups did all they could, uh, they could to bring the teachings of the Church into line with modern philosophic doctrines, and thereby incurred the increasing enmity of the Jesuit faction. They showed themselves skeptical of the relic and saint worship, and of religious sentimentalities in general. Moreover, they made no secret of their hostility to the Jesuits. The Benedictine order, long antedating the Jesuits, greatly angered the latter by their effort in promoting what is known as the quote, liturgical movement, unquote, a return to evangelical Christianity and an attempt to cleanse Catholic worship of modern innovations and superstitions, such as wonder-working devotions of the saints. They aimed this especially at the Jesuits' pet devotion of the Sacred Heart, which has been outdone, however, by more modern fads like the Little Flower Devotion. The Sacred Heart, I remind you, John Carroll was very, very much in favor of that. And John Carroll was the first Roman Catholic bishop in Baltimore in 1808 in the new-founded United States of America. And I do not go into the role of the Carrolls here, but he was very much in favor of the Sacred Heart. And you can read that, if I'm not mistaken, on page 216 in Rulers of Evil. And this little flower devotion that we are talking about here right now, I will not go into reading these heathen prayers, because really the hair of my, in my neck stood up when I read this, but I urge everyone to have a look at them and look for yourself at the webpage, web page that I will provide for you in the description box of this video, so you can understand and learn that for yourself. The Jesuits fought back by their usual underhand methods of playing on the fears of bishops and secular priests, and even by sending members of their order, disguised as laymen, to spy on the Benedictines. As was done at the Benedictine Abbey of Maria Lach, near Cologne, in Germany. A severe blow to the hopes of liberal Catholic groups was, was the syllabus of errors decreed by Antichrist Pope Pius IX, in 1864 that was, at Jesuit insistence. So he was, of course, also a puppet of the Jesuits. Because when you as Pope do not do what the Jesuits want you to do, you get done away with. Easy. And they know it. And that's why they play their role. And this um, brings me to an idea that I want to tell you. There is a new book coming out at the end of uh, this month, uh, August 2016, um, by P.D. Stewart, who wrote Code Word Babylon, about Pope Francis, a very, very current book, dealing with absolutely current issues. And as soon as I can get my hands on that, I will read that book. And I advise everybody to get an order on that. P.D. Stewart. One of these errors, the author continues in particular, fairly took the ground from under the feet of those who had striven for a more progressive and liberal Catholicism. In complete accord with traditional Jesuit intransigence, Antichrist Pope Pius XI solemnly condemned the proposition that, quote, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself to, and agree with, liberalism and modern civilization. Unquote. The history of the Roman Catholic Church entered a new phase with the proclamation of the dogma of the personal infallibility of the Pope, which was also railroaded through the Vatican Council in 1870 by the machinations of the Jesuits. That was one of the last actions of uh, Antichrist Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, the Vatican Council in 1870. 
This was the severest blow of all to the liberal elements, and certain groups hostile to the Jesuits followed Dullinger out of the church and established themselves as the Catholic Christian Church. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. <laughs> But the vast majority of those who had fought the Jesuits and opposed the dogma of infallibility bowed their heads and submitted with resignation. Bishop Fitzgerald of Little Rock, Arkansas, held out till the end and voted against it. So one had the guts to stand for his conscience. Archbishop Kenrick of St. Louis and five other American bishops left the council and returned home without voting. From that time the forces of reaction fought on, invisible from the outside, but all the more effectively, because they worked by intrigue and trickery. The popes themselves often aided this underhand working. At times they covered up the real intent of the Jesuits, and at other times they restrained them, lest, <coughs> lest their excessive zeal should wreck the Vatican's order, uh, other political maneuvers. In order to prevent the news from the increasingly bitter controversies waged at papal conclaves from reaching the public, Antichrist Pope Pius XI imposed an oath of perpetual silence on everyone connected with them in the future. All these developments paved the way for the Vatican's ecclesiastical support for the coming fascism. There followed a rapidly increasing trend in Catholic action in favor of rigorously authoritarian, conservative and solely hierarchical policies. Apparent yielding to contrary policies in democratic countries did not in any way affect Rome's fixed goal. It merely served to help its attainment, since it was able to employ what are now, what are now known as fifth column methods by using to its own purposes freedom of speech and religious tolerance in those countries. Sound familiar to people in the United States? Once democracy and freedom of speech have been obliterated by military might, as in Nazi fascist controlled countries in Europe, the real authoritarian and intolerant nature of Jesuit Catholicism comes to light. Now, does 9-11 now appear in a different light? Huh? What do you think? It immediately proclaims itself the ecclesiastical counterpart of civil dictatorship. What has happened in France since its capitulation to Hitler and Mussolini is a clear case of this. Likewise in Germany, the Catholic bishops in 1940 decreed a solemn oath of loyalty to Nazi socialism. And you have to understand that a Vatican dispatch to the New York Times in, uh, of September 17, 1940 stated that the Pope had decided that it was more dependent to defer official pronouncement of this pledge till the end of the war. Okay? So likewise in Germany the Catholic bishops in 1940 decreed a solemn oath of loyalty to Nazi socialism which will be kept under cover, under the blanket, until the end of the war, according to the dispatch to the New York Times in 1940. And in Slovakia, at the same year, the governmental structure of that country was publicly and officially declared to be a combination of Nazi socialism and Roman Catholicism. Catholic historians do not trouble to deny that the success of fascism is to a great extent due to the reactionary policies of the late Antichrist Pope Pius XI. Joseph Schmidlin, already quoted, in spite of his prudence in the matter, states, quote, This conservative heritage appears not only by the fact that the Pope Pius XI allied the Church to the fascist state, but also by the fact that he seeks to deprive the clergy and Catholicism of all political activity and strongly supports Catholic action, which is based upon the principle of an absolute hierarchy. Unquote. Well, this absolute hierarchy is called Ultramontanism. Look 
that up for better understanding. Schmidtlin also points out that the liberal, that liberal Catholic groups during the reign of Antichrist Pope Pius XI placed their last and only hope in the election of a liberal pope to succeed him. <laughs> yeah, a liberal pope? Uh, let's read on. <coughs> By the selection of the aristocratic conservative Cardinal Eugenio Percelli as Pius XII, that hope was forever frustrated. The fascist policies of the Vatican can be seen from the following four points. First, in the application of modern methods of political action, that is, fascist methods. Second, in the opposition to the one-time Catholic popular political parties. Third, in the distrust of the lower clergy, because of its too tolerant attitude toward pre-fascist ideas of individual rights and liberties. And fourth, in the creation of a movement of restoration, Catholic action entirely dependent upon Vatican bureaucracy. Now I have to go back to point three. And the distrust of the lower clergy because of its too tolerant attitude toward pre-fascist ideas of individual rights and liberties. I hope that you understand this. Distrust of the lower clergy. Why does the Roman hierarchy distrust its own lower clergy? Think about it. It is because of esoteric and exoteric knowledge. It's because of compartmentalization. You only know what you have to know to do your job. So when you are not initiated into quote-unquote all knowledge, when you are on a lower level, then of course you have another world view. You have another political view. You have another... You have a liberal view of things. You have even a view to reconcile with so-called heretics because you don't have the complete esoteric knowledge because you are not completely initiated. That's because it's a hierarchy, like a pyramid. It all runs together in the top in one point and that one point, that knows it all and all the others, they only know a part. So, the fascist policies of the Vatican can be seen from also this point that they distrust the lower clergy, which is a housemaid problem, because they are not given the information that the higher levels have been given. And so, of course, they are mistrusted, and that's why they are very strong in control, and whenever they do something wrong, they will be persecuted. And those are the Catholics that were persecuted in the Third Reich. So even the Nazi German Third Reich was Catholic to the, was Catholic to the core. They persecuted Catholic, uh, Catholics because they did not know the whole agenda. They were more liberal because they were of the lower clergy. All right? And that is in Germany, or that's happened in Germany during the Third Reich. The same will happen over there in the United States with all your so-called Protestant pastors who think they are doing a good work right now coming back under the wings of Rome but don't know the full agenda and to liberal Catholics in your city, county, state and country. They will also be persecuted. So don't be surprised when you see also Catholic persecution in your country. That will happen to the lower clergy, that will happen to Catholic laymen, that will happen to the people who do not have the full initiation 
and the full knowledge because of compartmentalization. I'm warning you now of what's going to happen in the United States anyway. But okay, we have one paragraph still to go to finish this wonderful part of the book Behind the Dictators. Much of the mystery of Vatican relations with Nazi fascism can thus be solved. Persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany has been directed only against those elements which did not entirely submit to the ever-increasing centralization of authority in church and state. What do you have now, 2016, in the United States of America? Since 1954, you have this 501c3 abomination to put church and state together. All right? Persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany has been directed only against those elements which did not entirely submit into the ever-increasing centralization of authority in church and state. So whenever in the United States of America today, more than 70 years after Lehman wrote this book, you are belonging to a church that is not 501c3, watch out because you are working against the ever-increasing centralization of authority in church and state. And when you are not a member of a 501c3 church, you personally are also a danger to your government. That's why they call biblical fundamentalists terrorists because when you're not with the state then you're against the state so when you're not in a state church when you're not in a 501c3 church you're against the state eh? aren't you watch out America persecution is coming in big steps to your country what Germany went through in the 1930s is being repeated in the United States of America. Just look to your hierarchy. Jesuits everywhere. Georgetown University puts out so many educated Jesuits for Hollywood and for Washington in the politics and in the entertainment industry. It's just incredible. Look it up for yourselves. Now you still have the internet, now you still have the possibility to do your own research. To this end, the Vatican helped to crush out the Catholic popular parties, both in Italy and Germany, and centralized all political matters in Rome. This ensured to the dictators freedom from popular interference on the part of Catholics. It established a more complete dictatorial regime within the Roman Catholic Church itself. It enabled the Vatican to enter into secret concordats with fascist countries already existing and with democratic countries like Spain, France, Belgium and Portugal after the destruction of their democratic governments by revolution and blitzkrieg. Finally, it left the way clear it left the way dear for complete harmony and unity between Nazi fascism and Jesuit Catholicism. Democratic countries like Spain, France, Belgium and Portugal. Well, in Spain you had the so-called civil war that brought the fascist leader Franco into power. France was overthrown within a few days in the Second World War. Belgium was already working on the side of the Jesuits with de Grey and his Rexit party. And Portugal, well, there they also installed a puppet. So whether you have it by revolution, which is probably the War of Spain they mean in 1936 that was, or Blitzkrieg, when the Germans started the Second World War in 1939. To me, a very, very interesting chapter this was. Nazi socialism 
and Catholic Restoration. And um, this book is getting interesting and interest and more interesting with every chapter I read. The next one will be chapter 9, Hitler's Fight Against the Churches. <laughs> and we're going to see a lot more of what I have spoken here in chapter 8 already then in chapter 9. So I really urge you to download the PDF of this book and to keep it on an extra hard disk from your computer with no access to the internet, that nobody can go into that, that you can save this book which you cannot get in any bookstore anymore. And listen to my readings if you like them. And download the videos and re-upload them to your own YouTube channel or Facebook or wherever Vimeo or whatever platform you have available to put the words out. This book, written in 1942, can also be understood as a warning to Americans in 2016 of what's really coming up. It's up to you what you do with it. You have been warned. You have been warned anyway by our Lord Jesus Christ who knows the end from the beginning and told in the Bible everything that will happen. Be prepared. And by that I don't mean to stock up on canned goods and weapons and ammunition, but get prepared. Put on the whole armor of God. That and only that can help you in the time to come. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you. Thank you for listening and watching. And until next time, bye bye.